Good morning to Moon Meditation more. How are you guys doing this morning? So it's getting chillier and chillier where we're located. A little bit chilly. No, I'm just got an extra layer on today, which is great. <clears throat> so if you want to go get your props and your blankets and your extra layers, I invite you to go do that now. I'm just setting up the recording for you. Sorry about that. It's taking a while. I don't actually, it was weird. I had it set up before, but I have these issues where some of the stuff slides and it just keeps falling back down again. Okay. Oh boy, yikes, right? Yeah, pretty crazy. Okay. So, all right. Alrighty. Okay. So I have some wood on the fire, which is good. So I'll eventually have some heat. Ha. Ah. And the way that we've normally been starting out in the morning, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> is uh, the thankful and grateful jar. So let me just go grab it. So I hope you all have your nice props, um, anything you might need today, glasses, books, um, notebooks, you know, anything like that, you know. Um, I'm going to be going over a little bit of aromatherapy again today. Today's, um, actually we're going to go over the chemistry. Yay, super fun. And today I'm going to um, read a little bit from, um, we had finished the heart of yoga. I think you guys remember that. Um, but I um, am gonna read a little bit <clears throat> of some, maybe some Sanskrit to maybe leave you with a mantra that you can say. Uh, in the future, you know, I was thinking about today going over a hand mudra, um, the one that I keep doing before we leave when I say Tashi delay. And what it means, let's see what else. I suppose what we could do too is there are some great verses in the Corinthians I really liked that I was thinking about going over. <coughs> so those are um, some of the areas that I was thinking on today. Okay, great. So, this morning, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do kind of what we started with, what I ended with last night, just so that you kind of see um, the essential oils and my morning routine, as it were, okay? Um, it was really great. I had a really uh, close friend of mine help me out and stop off and um, give me these essential oils so that I could continue working, which was really, really thoughtful and kind. I really appreciate it. Okay, so I'm, I took three drops of the On Guard, and I'm gonna rub it on the bottom of my feet so that it goes throughout the entire body system. And it should only probably take about 20 to 30 minutes. So this is all information that is typically, um, I believe, I hope, on the internet about aromatherapy. So I'm sure that there are some people that have been able to 
describe all the things that I'm describing to you now. Uh, I'm doing this in this mannerism for uh, members of brain injury and PTSD. And the reason that I'm doing that is that a whole group of us in the TBI network, we're trying to bring brand awareness for brain injured people and PTSD about how to have compassion and empathy and kindness about it. And um, yeah, so <laughs> generally so that other people will have a benefit to it and so they won't receive any harm. Uh, it's basically always generally a group of people that have been harmed, that found ways to heal or recover, and they're being kind out of the kindness of their heart to help others with that. I've been doing this pro bono, this aromatherapy yoga and meditation since I was 18 years old. I just recently graduated at 47 years old, which was a huge, huge thing for me because I am fully disabled. And I had been trying to get my teacher's certificate actively in the program before I got my injury in 2015. And in that injury, I could not speak. I couldn't tie my shoes. I wasn't awake a gross amount of the time. It was very scary. And at that time, I had to do my PALS. What a PALS is, is it's this plan for how you're going to end your life. Uh, what people will have to do for you or what you'd like to have done. And so I was introduced my first time to that process in 2015. And my been looking at neurologists and I've had neurologists checking my condition. Um, I've had three different hospitals look at it. And I guess I was just looking for confirmation. They were all explaining that unfortunately my my condition was permanent. And I guess to be perfectly honest, when you have PTSD and you have all this other stuff, when you hear that, it's easy to really give up. I don't know what it was inside of me that made me angry, <laughs> but it made me mad. <laughs> it was so weird. And I, I guess I really put all my fight into that. And I think that's what's difficult. I think that's where I find myself now where, you know, a lot of other people don't understand what's going on for the BTSD person and the TBI person. What they're actually struggling with is whether or not they feel valuable enough to be around still or whether their injuries preclude them from life in any which way, shape, or form. It was funny because up until the time that people started helping me with my condition, my family was okay with who I was. But I think they were kind of in a state of denial at the time. And I remember the doctors telling me that it was going to be extremely hard for people to let go of what I used to be and then accept what I was now. And I would find that a lot. And I did. 
I did. But can I tell you what impressed me and made me continue was that I had people, friends and family that did choose to love me, knowing everything. And I realized that there is such a thing as unconditional love. I realized it because I have it every day, in and out, all the time. And I had it for my family. I did. I do have it for my daughters, very much so. And it's, it's funny how you can love somebody so much that is hurting you, is being cruel or being harmful. And I'm sure that's, that's what some of you are thinking right now. Now, I'm lucky enough right now where I think my, my loved ones are so busy that that I guess I always assume the best out of them. You know, one thing was about my personality was that I always tried to see the good things in people. I always tried to see what was okay. I always tried to help someone that was in a worse situation than me. And I got a lot I, I got a lot of people that actually attacked me, made fun of me, put me down for helping elderly people, for helping people that were paralyzed from the neck down. I had people making fun of me for helping um, so many, do so many things. And instead, because these people that I were assigned to through um, my peace center, they made the assumption, it was very disturbing, but people made the assumption that I was inappropriate and having sexual misconduct, that I was doing all these strange things. And I guess, honestly, it really hurt my feelings because the only sex I'd ever had was with my husband, and that should be perfectly okay. <laughs> and nobody else should actually know about my sex life with my husband. So or my ex-husband, I should say. So if they were finding out about it, that's a little disturbing. Wouldn't you say as a wife? That's not okay. That's a breach of confidentiality. And I, I think what's unfortunate is that sometimes when you become a mindful, or when you're studying mindfulness, and then I said this to actually my mindfulness teachers, I said, you know what bummed me out when I came to study with you people? And they're like, what happened, April? And I said, I just feel really sad about this, but people got weird. People got competitive. They tried to harm me. They, and I went down this long list of, of how people responded. And I couldn't figure it out. And I have to say that maybe the last four years that I was studying there from 2009 to 2012. I remember I would ask these questions from Gayume Kenza Rinpoche love song Jampa. And I would wonder, and I would go and ask questions from Wilson Hurley, Lauren Ladner. And the entire time I was actually trying to how my teacher, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, with a way to honestly, um, I thought it would be good to help people learn meditation, okay? Just meditation. Wasn't sure about mindfulness, to be perfectly honest, because I thought I thought that people could use mindfulness the wrong way. I felt like, unfortunately, if someone got wrong view, 
they would end up being cruel and evil instead of being compassionate, kind, and thoughtful. Because what they might do is be comparing the rest of the world to what they either attained or received versus another person. And I said, well, if they're starting with that process right there, that's the wrong process to have. You're already at wrong view. So I don't know. Sometimes I used to wonder if everybody should take mindfulness. I'm not so sure that everybody actually should. <laughs> I think that everybody should learn meditation. Those are breathing exercises. I think your lungs want to be strong. I think your muscles want to be strong. I think you want to learn how to make your muscles strong, but also relax them. So I do not see a problem with that. I think what I saw a problem with a lot of the times was people were not able to accept the fact that I simply grew up with one religion and learned it my whole life. And then I, in my head, when I became older, read other books about other religions because that was available to me. Now, that's a really big foreign concept, I think, for some people. Having an ability to be multicultural. Some people are still trying to be like, how can you be multicultural? Well, that's easy. You grow up in more than one country before the age of 10. Okay? The other question is... <laughs> Just because I lived in other countries does not mean that I speak other different languages. I was tiny. And then the last one. Because I met and was encouraged to have an open mind and an open heart and not be judgmental of other people from other countries. Because of the of what my dad had to do for a living, which was travel. Right? That's how I kind of oddly got interested in multiple different religions. <laughs> now, because I have a brain injury, most people do not believe me. So, this is my picture from when I was a baby. And I was getting picked up. These are actually the photos in here, okay? In this album that my adoptive family made me of how I entered the country and where I went. So it was really fun. This was uh, the first place I lived in Hawaii before I got to Connecticut. This is Hawaii. Here I am when I'm small. Here I am with my adoptive family, my adoptive sister. And here I am coming from Korea. This is when we were traveling around. And I tend to like it, apparently, at the beach quite a bit. I've always loved the beach. Always. Like the beach in the forest. <laughs> I 
And the album goes on into other things. I mean, I could bore you with a lot of pictures. <laughs> My dad's got millions of them and slides and everything. Um, but I will not do that. That's crazy. Okay. So that kind of just shows you that. Uh, let's see. How can I go forward? Let's see. Oh, we put the aroma touch on the spine. We bid the on guard on our feet. I showed you the other day about how to do the dilution of a hand sanitizer and what you could do if you wanted to be in a lotion. For some of us where it's really, really dry, I do a lotion. So here's something um, that I just got off the counter. Um, I'm gonna go, um, you know, there's another one that I invite you to do, which is to take any salve that doesn't have a bunch of other essential oils in it, but it's just a, a plain salve. Now, I don't know if you know how to make your own salve. It's really not hard, okay? What you wanna do is get the um, pharmaceutical grade beeswax. They come in these, it, like, they come in these little tiny, tiny, tiny things that actually look like jasmine rice they look like jasmine rice <laughs> and i melt them uh then i add a little bit of grapeseed oil probably one percent about one percent of aloe i normally add one teaspoon of vitamin e oil And I normally add 1% of Yehoba. You know, I steer away from Shai. A lot of people ask me about that. I oftentimes will direct people to grapeseed, which is a very light oil on the skin and it absorbs really quickly. Um, those are generally for the people that um, don't like essential oil. <laughs> and or like that oily feeling on their skin. There's a lot of people who do not like that oily feeling on their skin. Or what I'll oftentimes do is I'll put it into Yehoba. Yehoba is very close to being able to be a massage oil that's really close to um, how the body also interprets oils as being natural. So that's nice. Today, I'm not gonna put Unwind on, if you notice, not in the morning. In the morning, I'm only doing the aroma touch that's down my, from my occipital all the way down my spine, and I'm doing On Guard, okay? So we're gonna do the Thankful and Grateful jar. That's something that I started in the beginning. And we haven't done it a lot, so I'm just going to catch you up on what's already in there. So we're coming up at the end of January, going into a month for compassion and love and kindness and support and peace. I, I oh gosh, I really hope you guys have a really good, had a good 2021 and that it's so much better than 2020 i really do i hope it's so much better for you all um it just seems like there was someone out there that was extremely unhappy and taking out their traumas on everybody else it was pretty awful good grief <laughs> if i didn't know any better i'd think it was my ex <laughs> he was a little bit ooh, uh a little bit traumatized okay so here let's go into here but you know what Everybody has different stuff when they're growing up. And some people either get over it or they keep bashing it into everybody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you're either going to find a way to get healthy physically and then eventually mentally, or you're going to keep taking your hate and your anger and your resentment and bashing it over someone else's head. Somehow that doesn't seem like a kind thing to do. <laughs> so I was trying to get away from that as fast as possible about being that type of person. I actually ended up um, going and seeing a lot of doctors. And it was really funny because my path of 
a finding that was actually oddly finding people who genuinely cared about me and loved me unconditionally. Um, I started going to friends to, for the first time in my life, oddly, ask them if they were my friend back. And I have to say, I want to thank you guys. Because for all of you guys that remained my friends and hung in there and stuck in, I really appreciate you. I just want you to know that. Even if you cannot see me right now, and you're wondering how I am, I just want you to know that, um, you know, I'm funny like that, I guess. I guess I'm always gonna be that person. I was talking to some really close people of mine that, that care about me and I was talking to them and they were saying, you know what, April, you were, you're still, no matter what, what you are personally going through and how difficult it is. I mean, you've been recovering, you know, you got injured in 2015, you got injured in 2017, these are all accidents. And you got injured again in 2019, same fall, same injuries, same severity. And they're like, it could have killed you. It's not okay. It's really not okay what happened to you. And they really had me sit down and think about it. And they said, look what kind of person you were. Here you were. You weren't well. And that entire time that you were suffering and living, you were homeless, you were separated from your husband, you didn't know if you were getting a divorce or not because he honestly was having a difficult time with the TDI. My family was having a difficult time with it and I understood it. I said, you know what, I get it, okay. Do you want me to not return? That's what I asked in 2016. Do you never need me to return because I'm going to, the doctors say, be different than what I was before? They don't know how. They don't know if I'll fully recover or not. And that's really, really tough, isn't it? It's really difficult. All of a sudden, you realize that's what you're looking at. And I think that's why I looked for second and third opinions. I was like, you know what? I did, I looked for second and third opinions. And I was like, you know what? I'm hoping that there are people out there that have maybe discovered new things and that can help me. Maybe there wasn't an anal enough knowledge where I was, in the location I was. So, I guess what I decided to do was see if there was um, other doctors that had the resources of neuromapping, you know, things like that out there. I was uh, trying to get them where I was located and I think what's difficult is when your ex-spouse never actually goes to the doctor or talks to the doctor about your condition, I invite you to make sure that the people that you love are there when you go to the doctors. If they don't talk to your doctors with you, then they're really not showing a lot of care and concern for you. And you know, that's something I found out. Um, something else I found out in the process of going was that you have to be careful of your finances. You know, people can actually take from you. 
They can steal your physical assets. Like I used to own things and people were starting to steal my belongings. And things that were valuable, which was strange because I didn't really actually have much. I only had this pin that oddly, Keith Richards oddly, had given his friend Martin, Roy Martin, and Roy had given it to me when I was a single mom and said, April, I hope you're okay. And he gave me this pin when I was a single mom. I was so afraid being a single mom of hardly marrying someone who wouldn't accept my daughter as their own child or that would harm me or my child because they didn't really understand what it was like to be a single parent. It's interesting. I think in time what you do is you look for people in your life to blame. So instead, what I did with my thankful and grateful jar of 2021 is to decide to thank all my enemies. To thank everybody in Connecticut that I grew up with. To thank everybody in all the countries I've ever lived in. I'm thankful for magic. Magic was my way of saying love. Family. It's funny, I used to talk about magic to my daughters and what I was always describing, honestly, was how I loved them. So I'm going to put love in there. I have peaceful rest. I learned a new skill. Wellness resources and practitioners. My friend, my enemy, clean underwear, <laughs> mundane tasks, some food, music, faith. You know, something weird that happened too, but I went back and I was trying to recover and I started doing all this stuff, this thankful and grateful jar, all these things that my doctors were teaching me. Everybody around me made fun of me, told me I was crazy, told me that I was messed up, told me that this stuff didn't work, it was hullabalooky. They laughed in my face. I tried to bring this to hospitals and doctors and all sorts of things, and people literally laughed at me in Connecticut. They made fun of me. They terrorized me. Yeah, it was pretty bad. <laughs> it sucked, man. A lot of people condemned me. Um, so for the people that were actually supportive, thoughtful, kind, loving, and caring, oh man, did I appreciate them in Connecticut. And that is why I am saying thank you. <laughs> I am so grateful for the people who know who they are and for their names to remain unannounced and for my friends in different countries and all over. I want to, I want to thank you for knowing that who I was never actually changed. I appreciate that because there was a lot of other people who got weird and wanted to emotionally trigger me and keep me in PTSD all the time and thought it was funny. They thought it was funny to harm me emotionally and verbally and emotionally abuse me. So during that five years while I was brain injured, there was a group of people that thought it was okay and funny to emotionally abuse someone that had PTSD. I'm gonna ask the rest of the world who has PTSD. You guys think that's okay? You think these regular citizens that don't understand other people that have afflictions in their life 
that PTSD or emotional traumas, you think that that's somehow a joke. Do you want to go tell that to a bunch of war veterans? Because you want to know who had compassion for me when I went to the dispensary to go pick up my medicine? War veterans. Do you want to know why? They asked me what happened to me. Do you want to know why war veterans had compassion for me? Because I was one of the first female Asian minorities to be adopted into the United States of America. Do you have any idea what kind of racism, prejudice, humiliation, and anything else I would have to endure? I was born in another country in 1970 from a third world country that was technically at the time a third world country. When the vet war veterans who were actually trying to prevent the things that happened to me in this states, which was to be emotionally and verbally abused, sexually molested as a small child, and then raped my first five times because everybody that raped me thought it was funny because I was a female minority and I wasn't worth anything. Okay, sorry I digress. And I'm obviously in the morning, as we know, emotionally charged before I have my medicine. Okay. So I'm going to be thankful for the stars. I'm trying to refocus in a positive direction, but it's difficult. As I've told you, I have PTSD and there's been a lot of hurtful, harmful people trying to purposely, emotionally abuse me. It's so fucked up. Excuse my language. Earth. Interesting, I put yoga space and DNKL, which is where I studied and who I was trying to build this website for and launch eventually to say thank you to all my friends and family who were quote unquote supportive, loving, and kind to me. Now, a lot of those people were. Some of them were not. I had the Schwams, the Mikhails down here some friends of mine that I knew. I had audience viewers. I had moon, insurance, oxygen, moments, peace of mind, bare feet, friends, life, Did my disability. And I have to say, I told people in the networks and my doctors and things like that, that there probably should not be a brand awareness campaign for this. And they said, why? And I said, because there is half of the population who's been traumatized, who doesn't even know they've been emotionally, verbally, or physically abused, and are completely unaware of it because they've never gone to a psychology class in their life <laughs> because maybe they didn't go to college. And I said, you are going to make that entire population very confused. <laughs> and I'm not so sure they're ready for it. They think that they've had these horrible, horrible traumas in life. I can see that. They're posting them all over the internet. Do you know who doesn't have it? You know who does not have what you have, which is the ability to complain and bitch, are people that have PTSD. You know why? Because typically, they don't get up here and tell you this. They hide. They run away from the rest of you because the rest of you are kind of effed up towards them. You actually continue emotional and verbal abuse most of the times and make their conditions a lot worse. <clears throat> it's why I thank the Schwams. 
my adoptive family because they didn't want to harm me. You know, that was the interesting. My, my true, genuine people who loved me didn't want to see me get harmed anymore. They didn't want to be cruel to me. They didn't want to make fun of me. They didn't want to hurt my feelings. And I realized, oh, <laughs> you don't? Why? Everybody does. <laughs> I was so confused. It took me years to find out that I had been being emotionally abused by my friends. It was awful. <laughs> I had to let go of those friends. They weren't good people. I'm going to put down my daughters. I have down here the Wines and the Webbers. Emotional support. I have the Lloyds. The Lashinskys. Four Seasons. Sun. And actually, oddly, my favorite, when I'm awake. <laughs> Spend a lot of time asleep. Or in lucid dreaming. And in this lifetime, didn't get a lot of the awake state. I, uh, I suffered from narcolepsy. It's a sleeping disorder. It puts you at a lot of risk. It's pretty crazy. Uh, they understood that it was genetic. And luckily, it skips generations, which is good. It can. It doesn't have to. I mean, I got together with my ex. My ex had sleeping issues and was an insomniac. Still is, actually. Still can't get a heck of a lot of sleep, to be honest with you. It was always something that uh, my ex always struggled with. The entire family struggled with uh, sleeping issues. In fact, uh, thank goodness I was able to finally figure out what was wrong with my kids and was able to help them. Uh, most people didn't believe me, didn't want to listen to me, thought I was crazy, and I kept going to the doctors, and finally the doctors were like, you know what? No, she's right. Mrs. McHale's right. And it took me years to help my kids. So I'm glad I stuck in there and stuck strong and did that and got them not only the Eastern but the Western medicines that they needed. So I feel good about that. It wasn't easy. I was literally fighting an entire world saying, you're crazy, blah, blah, blah. They also didn't believe in aromatherapy. They uh, didn't know that medicine came from it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, they didn't know that that was the origination of medicine. No joke. They didn't understand why we had to migrate to Western medicine. Yeah, no kidding. Dead serious. Okay, so today we're going to write down what we're thankful and grateful for. And a lot of people keep asking me, are you married? Are you single? I am single. I don't know why people keep asking me this. <laughs> but I don't date. And everybody's like, what are you, gay? And I'm like, I'm not gay. <laughs> and I don't want to date. I'm middle-aged. Life has been difficult, <laughs> as you can see. And I guess people were asking, what are you trying to do with your life then? And it was funny. I said, um, live it with a positive, productive purpose. And it's hard. I, I keep wanting to get a really good job or something I'm good at. The only thing I really liked was cooking. And when I found it in Connecticut, everybody else got so jealous that all they did was try to undermine me to get my job as a disabled person. 
I remember two of my employers, one at the, actually at the Tibetan Center, and one where I was working in the kitchen that was like, April, why do, you know, I feel so bad. People, people really don't understand disabilities. And I said, no. And they also don't understand, like, if you're have anxiety and you're nervous and you don't feel well, you know, one common thing is to nervously laugh. But what people never looked at was my body language because they didn't care. They were there to hurt me. They were there to be selfish and, and to do sexual misconduct and all sorts of things. And they were not there for the right reasons. And I think what women are finding difficult in the workforce is that men do not respect women in the workforce or in the homes anymore. You know, it's, it's really sad to me, but I am hearing a lot of people during COVID experiencing emotional, verbal, and physical abuse in relationships. There are a lot of couples that this is happening to, a gross amount. And it made me sad because I was like, do the parents even know that this is happening? Like. Do the, do the parents know because, you know, a lot of the times people think just because they're angry, they're right. And just because they're offended, they're correct. And what they do is they gather everybody onto their side to say, see, I can blame you. It's you, 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 you. I'm going to explain something to you guys. Blame is not something that works great. If you are finding yourself in a relationship where that's all you're doing, I invite you to go see a psychologist or an LCSW or a therapist and work through some of the emotional past traumas that you have. You obviously, and I'm so sorry, experienced some pretty bad ones. And I am so, so, so sorry. I think that's awful. But I also think it's awful that the rest of the world is in reality cruel. I said, do you know what it'll do? to me if I go up there and I say the things that you guys are asking me to say. And everybody was in support of it. No, April, do this, you know, blah, 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 blah. This is good for other people, blah, 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 blah. So I got up and I did it. Do you want to know what they did? They publicly humiliated me on purpose so that when I did it, they could all laugh. And instead, try to prove that people who have severe TBIs, people who have PTSD, that their feelings don't matter. That the only people that matter in that scenario are the caregivers and the health practitioners. And I invite you to wonder sometimes when they tell you they don't know a lot about brain injuries and that they're currently finding it out, then what right is it of all of those health practitioners if they didn't understand the process to take out their frustrations on their patients? When was that okay? Because that's what I received for the past two and a half years. When people couldn't understand it, when they couldn't really relate to it, when they couldn't identify it, when the doctors couldn't explain it, instead of helping the person that was injured and protecting that person, who are you supposed to protect? Who's your patient? Do you even care about your patients, you practitioners? 
I think that's what upset me. And I think that upsets a lot of people that probably go through or are encouraged to do certain studies. You know, I think that you have to be really careful out there. There's a lot of people, for whatever reason right now, that feel that they are entitled to harm others. They're using their mindfulness lessons or they're using psychology sometimes off of the internet. No joke. Ask them, are they actually with a psychiatrist or are they using it off the internet? You know, that's terrifying. That's like crackpot psychology. You think you're smarter because you read a paragraph off the internet about psychology. You didn't study it for the past 25 years like the kids that actually studied psychology did. And you want to know why they were forced to do that for 12 to 15, 20 years? Because there's a moral ethical conduct code. If someone didn't really, really understand that, they could harm a lot of people, couldn't they? And so I just kind of invite you to think about your psychology. And when I say your psychology, that's when I'm saying no harmful thoughts for yourself or others. When you start immediately placing blame on other people, you are already harming them. You're only being selfish. You're only thinking about yourself. It means you're a very self-centered person. Where is your actual focus? Are you helping other people? Are you doing anything outside of yourself to help anyone else? Is that something that exists in you? But are you helping someone because it's technically a selfish reason? You're getting something out of it. Unconditional love, love that does not have conditions, is a difficult thing. It's very challenging. My thought is, it might even be unattainable. <laughs> um, with the kinds of people that are in this world now, pretty unattainable. And I'll tell you why. For that to kind of happen, doesn't there have to be good people who can see that happening? Well, <laughs> do you think emotionally traumatized people are able to tell until they're better that they've even ever been helped? a good question, right? I used to say that this thing where just because you're angry doesn't mean you're right. And just because you're offended didn't mean you were correct. So we're working on the mind today and we're going to go down to the meditation. And then actually we're going to stop. I'll pick up the aromatherapy lesson probably later this afternoon. I've been teaching a couple of classes a day. Uh, so I've been kind of tired with that. But thank you for the vote of confidence, you guys. I really appreciate it. And really, this was just to bring out brand awareness and to give you guys the ability to study underneath the lineages that I did if that's something that's available for you, okay? Now, as I said before, should everybody study mindfulness? I don't know, I'm not so sure. You know, I think you'd have to go to the mindfulness te teachers and talk about that, um, whether or not they thought that was a good concept. You know, sometimes being in your mind too much is a bad thing and it actually turns you into a really terrible person. So, like you might start acting out like like basically to harm other people instead of be kind, compassionate, and thoughtful. And 
it's sad, but people generally uh, act out on the people that are closest to them and push them all away first. It's, it's very weird. <laughs> it's a really weird cycle. Okay, uh, it's always the people that oddly, normally, um, that you can, I guess, I don't know, I'm not really sure. You know, I've always wondered why people do that. And I honestly think that what ends up happening is they stop communicating. They stop talking. Well, once you stop communicating or having an interchange, you've technically told people you don't want to have a relationship with them once you've stopped communication. I know that because I was a single mother and my first daughter, who I'm very proud of and love very much, had a different biological father and being in a blended family, it caused a lot of complications and problems. It was very difficult. There are some blended families that work out well because both partners want it to. <laughs> um, you really need both partners to really understand what they're doing in a blended family and, um, and the potential for harm. Uh, it, was, it was something I invite all single parents to really consider, oddly, because I was sold to bill of goods that the person that came up next but I, oh, they understand blended families. They have so much compassion. They're so wonderful. Oh, they're practically God, <laughs> right? Well, nobody's God, okay? Nobody's God, and that's a reality. Um, we are all just humans, and those of us that think that we're gods need more help than the other people. <laughs> they're the ones that actually have wrong view, no joke, yeah, yeah. I mean, I told this to my, my, uh, my mindfulness teacher and my therapist. I basically said, like, for me to believe that, the, when I finally, like, researched Buddha and stuff like that, I said, oh, my goodness, you know what Buddha was? And then he goes, what? I go, wow, he's the biggest narcissist ever. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty intense. And boy, did he have a lot of emotional trauma. And it looks to me like he had severe PTSD. That's when my teachers were like, oh my God, why do you know that? And the weird thing is, is can I tell you something? They knew I didn't know the story of Buddha completely. No joke, I didn't. I would only, I'm an auditorial learner. So they knew the only things I'd ever learned, they had said to me. I might not have even gotten it out of a book. <laughs> they just said it to me because I was an auditorial learner. Now, I had told that to my teachers many, many times that I learned differently, that I could not read, that I couldn't take a test. And they were like, you can't take a written test. Then how are we going to pass you with people who have disabilities? Not everybody in the world is willing to work with people that have disabilities. And that can be hard, and that can be challenging, and it be, can be difficult. And I was really grateful and thankful for the people that came into my life that tried so very hard to help me. They tried to tell other people to have more compassion for me, to be more understanding, to not make fun of me, that it was something not to be made fun of. It's sad because I literally watched it hurt my friends. The more that people went after me, the more that they attacked me, I watched it hurt my Tibetan friends. My friends that actually had grown to really care about me. And I didn't want them to get harmed anymore by being in association with me. So I left. 
And everybody always wondered, why did you leave? And I said, because people hurt me and I don't want you to get harmed. So what I'm gonna be thankful and grateful for really is that I have actually been harmed so much. I'm gonna say perpetually harmed by others and ridiculed. I went to the people in TBI Network and I said, please don't make me get up on that podium. Do you have any idea what that means? This is my life. It'll destroy my life. And everybody else said, why are you getting up there? And I said, oh, it feels awful. I'm gonna lose everything. I'll lose my life, I'll lose my friends, I'll lose a lot when I tell my side of the story. I'll lose my family, I'll lose my husband, I will lose everything. I'm not like other people. There are some other people that can get up on a podium and be respected. But with my disability and with my PTSD and with everything else that I've had, what I learned about that disability is it gave everyone else the right to make fun of me, to use me as the classroom joke, to steal things from me that I had done well and benefit and throw me under the bus. And there's very few people that didn't try to throw me under the bus. It made me feel sad. And I guess everybody always wondered, why are you doing so much pro bono? Why, why are you being so nice to me, April? Why, why are you? And they would question my intentions on all this other stuff. And... <laughs> I will respectfully put here harmed perpetually and ridiculed for my disability and because of it I'm writing it in the thankful and grateful jar it was the thing that harmed me the most in my life the thing I could never outrun I was the lowest common denominator and all my friends knew it and my family and the rest of the world. They couldn't wait to hurt me because of it. They just couldn't wait, could they? So I hope you are happy putting me up there and having me be a modern day carry. You know, I think I might have been stupid. I kept thinking that morals and ethics and values mattered in the world, that she, people should be nicer to each other. They shouldn't harm each other. But there is a point at which you're like, you know what? You give up. You don't have hope or faith or compassion anymore. Because you just keep getting kicked in the teeth. I'll tell you who the people are with PTSD. They're so tired of being kicked in the teeth and taking one for the team. And the team 
ridiculing, making fun of them, pretending that they give a shit when they really don't. Empty promises, all these things. They're awful. They feel terrible. That's why someone who has PTSD, they're being constantly traumatized by their condition. They don't need help from the rest of you. What they needed was peace and solace and love and compassion. But apparently, none of you are capable of that. I was really surprised. I was this person that believed in all the good things in other people and all my friends loved me for it. You know why they're so upset right now? Because I turned around and I saw everybody else for who they actually were. And when I did, I cried and I walked away because they had been harming me for so long, ridiculing me, emotionally abusing me. They were so emotionally traumatized themselves. They were never able to see the good things in me. And when they were, all they wanted to do was take me out of the sky and shoot me out of it. So instead of just enjoying the flower that was next to them, they had to cut all the other flowers out in the garden and be the only flower. That's not a garden, guys. That's not a garden. I had had everybody's backs, been everybody's so-called best friend, said nice things about them behind their backs, only to find out, here I am, saying, oh, this person's great at this, this person's great at this, trying to defend the other person all the time to other people, and I'm getting shot out of the sky. And I'm like, you know what? Why should I fight for the value of other people. I'm done. No more. You know what? Y'all have created a very self-centered world. Very narcissistic. I guess you're really impressed with yourself. Was it divide and conquer? Divide up all the families? Keep everybody's loved ones away from each other? For what purpose? Why would you do that? Why would anybody do that? That seems cruel, indecent, and harmful. And it sounds like a bunch of people taking out their weird emotional traumas on other people. And when I started to go, I was like, are you mindfulness teachers or are you people in psychology that are taking out your aggressions on other people for your past pain? So I started asking my psychologists if they had ever received trauma <laughs> and whether or not they were cured from it. Because let me tell you something, if you're gonna go to your psychiatrist and their, your psychiatrist has PTSD and never gotten over it or in an emotional trauma and keeps bringing that up during session, at which point, who's helping who? <laughs> Seriously, I'm like in session and I'm like, oh yeah, you had that problem growing up? Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That had to have been difficult for you. <laughs> like, what is happening here? I thought I was coming to see you, not uh, you were coming to see me in the 25th session. What's going on? <laughs> I'm confused. Okay, so I'm gonna write down moral and ethical conduct, okay? I know it's something that apparently nobody has anymore. Oh, wait, no, maybe some people do. I'm sorry, I should not be so negative. Maybe some people have ethical moral conduct. That would be cool. I'm not seeing a lot of it on Facebook, I gotta be honest with you. <laughs> I'm a preschool teacher. I'm sure all of you guys have gone to teachers in your life and instructors and been like, are you guys seeing this stuff? This is really weird. I mean, people are doing some really weird, creepy things out there. They are becoming unhinged. And I was saying to some of my friends, I think they need a psychiatrist 
or an LCSW or something like that. I mean, I feel like I need one. <laughs> I was like, seriously, I'm seriously, I do. I'm like, I, to me personally, I, I like it. I like to have my mind clear. And I don't wanna have harmful intentions, speech or actions towards other people. So, you know, I have been working on that my whole life. And a lot of people make fun of me for it. They think I'm a real tool. Nice to know, right? That being a nice person is to be a tool. <laughs> is it? Because can I ask you something? Who is stronger in the end? You got to ask yourself, who's the stronger person? I'm going to say it's going to be that person that when they get pushed over so hard and their teeth are caved in and they have no brain left and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they've gone through the windshield of a car and, you know, been run over by a car and all that fun stuff. You know, when those kinds of things that happen to you, I'm going to say those are the same kinds of people that help. Everybody wanted to know, well, if you're this way, how do you help anybody? I'm 50 years old. I was married. I had two kids. And up until 2015, I had a very successful family, I feel, for the most part. <laughs> as good as it gets, really, you know? I mean, as good as it gets, you know? You try. You try hard. Apparently, there's a lot of people out there that think that they know things. They think they're very smart. Well, and congratulating them. And they're very good at congratulating themselves and batting themselves on the back. And I think that's a really good thing to have good self-esteem. I think when it goes wrong is when you think you're above everybody else. When you think you're better than everybody else. When you think that somehow... You have an advantage over other people. I think the two hardest lessons in life are humility and perseverance. In this lifetime, it's very difficult to have humility. All right. Some things to go over. It's really funny. I know I was taking this one course and I had to ask all these questions, answer these questions. They were kind of interesting. And one of them was mindfulness. And I said, always be present. To be one with the divine. To tie the strands of the mind together. Coming together. A physical interpretation. And to attain that which was previously unattainable. When they're talking about attaining the previously unattainable, that's when they're talking about agape or agape or unconditional love, um, boundless love, some people call it. All right, those are all fun things. Okay. Ultimately, yoga is a cellular, regenerative, and restorative And that's why people do it. So a lot of people are like, well, what's the purpose of yoga besides just, you know, getting fit or something like that? It is technically regenerative and restorative on the cellular level. Now it is once you get to meditation and it is once you get to one hour of meditation. Uh, I feel like I get the most benefits when I get to three or four hours. So try to hang in there, okay? And see if you can meditate up to three to four hours. Once you can do that, you really do start getting true benefits. I would say that it can lead to a different interpretation 
of your mind and body, your consciousness, that which you can understand, and your ability to have harmony. I suppose you would either call it with nature or with a higher power, you know, whatever you want to say. It's a practice that takes breath and involves the body. The inhale returns to rest. Now, some of you that are more familiar with this, I'm going to say this one way. I guess it's describing how, huh, how would I say it in English? Destri describing how the breath goes through different avenues in the body. Not avenue, streets. Okay, imagine your, your, your body's like um, Manhattan. New York City. Uh, it's a grid, so it's a little bit easier. Um, and you can go down certain roads two ways. Some of them you can't. <laughs> okay? Those specific channels would be called, like, nadis. And breath that's either entering or leaving the body... Um, or energy, you know, some people call it breath, some people call it energy, a lot of people call it, uh, have different terminology for it, uh, another one's prana. And then, you know, it's really about our relationship with others. You know, do we have good relationships with other people? Our behavior, our health, our breathing, our path to being calm. I want to say that I feel like the reason that humility is such a difficult one is because it's the quality of someone who kind of is uh, got clear wisdom, as I would call it. Sometimes people call it perfect wisdom. I, I don't know. You know, a lot of people say different things about that. So, you know, that can be a little bit interesting. Um, it's interesting because there's, in my practice, I kind of was looking, you know, at all the gods and goddesses and... <clears throat> A lot of times with your uh, root gurus, they'll ask you, like, who you identified with or something like that. And it was funny because I did it in such a weird process. I didn't know that people were trying to identify, like, with who they were, right? I thought the whole process was, I don't know. I didn't understand it. So when I was in class and... They say, well, April, how did you pick out your gods and goddesses? Like, who did you pick? And I said, well, can I tell you what's strange? Like, I didn't really know how you guys were doing this. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. And all the gods and goddesses look so nice. I didn't, I don't know. I started feeling bad picking one over the other. I know that's weird. That's really weird. It's so strange. <laughs> I was like, I know. It's, it's not normal. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's, that's just weird. But... I'm looking at all the gods and goddesses, and I'm looking around them, and I'm like, oh, that's so funny. You know what? Uh, the way that I picked mine is kind of strange. I got to be honest. I went like this over the book <laughs> with both my fingers, and I went. And I landed my two fingers down. No joke. <laughs> that's how I picked my gods and goddesses in yoga. Okay, most people... Pick with the one they identify with, okay? <laughs> April didn't know what was going on. And April was like, let's make this fun. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Okay. 
<laughs> and I was like, what game can we play? Okay, so then I looked at it and I was like, oh, who did I pick? And I'll tell you who the gods and goddesses that I picked. And it's funny. I'm not even sure if it's right because, right, like I just did this. And my, of course, you know, uh, my teachers are going, no, actually, April, that's perfect. We're so happy that you did that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, I did something weird. <laughs> and I was like, oh, everybody else got it right, didn't they? <laughs> and I was like, darn it. I was like, oh, come on. But, oh, well. So I'll read to you what I picked out. And, and I think this helps people. And I'll tell you why I think I, it helps people. Because I'm the lowest common denominator. It's, it's almost impossible for me to pass a class. No joke. Impossible. Um, and the reason being for the most part is most people require you to take a written test. They won't work with people that have disabilities. And uh, not, not when I was growing. Uh, it was different when I was growing up. They didn't know as much about how the brain is and how people learn and all that fun stuff. They've learned a lot since then. Anyways, so it's Sarasvati. Apparently, she was the goddess of speech and sound. Uh, she was the first being in Brahma's world. She was the river consciousness that enlivens creation, dispels darkness, ignorance, and rejoice in serenity of spirit. She's supposed to represent purity. She transcends the cravings of humanity. She rejoices in the powers of the mind. She's the patron of wisdom. She's the embodiment of purity and sublime nature. The Vedas were her offspring. And in the beginning, there was only chaos, formless, fluid knowledge, and she brought order to disorder. Her image heralds a peacock holding sacred books and a vena, and she's dressed in white and rides a swan. The quote that I picked that I liked about her was, knowledge helps man find possibilities where once all he saw was problems. And the other goddess that I picked, honestly, it was interesting, both of mine were goddesses, fascinating. The other goddess I picked was Lakshmi. She was the goddess of fortune, wealth, love, prosperity, and beauty. And out of churning waters rises from the waves, seated on a full-bloomed lotus. She chooses Vishnu as her master, and she chooses the gods over the demons. The god's power is then restored, and she, the goddess of fortune, forsakes the arrogance of mankind. Her four hands are supposed to represent dharma, karma, artha, moksha, and she was the wife of Vishnu. I was asked what my wish was, what I wanted. And I said, I wish for all things to not be harmed. I feel like it might be the same as compassion in Tibetan Buddhism. The wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering, it counters cruelty. To reach this sublime state of mind by extending our love to all sentient beings. They said, what do you get the most benefit from? And I said, it's interesting, the action of repeating the mantra or the name of a deity aloud or in my mind. I was asked my description of an asana. I said, it's an offer. It's a salutation. It's a promise. It's a vow. And it seals my vow. It's 
So I ask you, what hand gesture is commonly used to open and greet? And that can be your homework. For the beginning and the closing of easy pose. So I invite you to go look it that up on the internet and in your little comment section. <laughs> I don't know how you guys get these things. These are fantastic. Um, you're very clever. You know that? Very clever. Very impressed with the internet these days. Very interesting. Um, for all the positive things that it's been doing. Very, very, very impressed. You guys are pretty awesome out there. You go with all your good self and your authentic self. You guys are doing an awesome job out there. The ones that are that are not causing harm. Thank you so much. We need so many more of you. So you can get back to me on that one. And when you do, tell me what the purpose for it is. How does it benefit you? People ask me what my favorite pose was. I said Shavasana. I like Shavasana. It's a reminder for every body muscle to remember where it's supposed to be. It cools you down. It allows you to process information that you just mentally and physically downloaded. And it allows you to let it sink in because it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic. I like it because it removes mental and physical obstacles. So for me, that was my most favorite pose. Um, in my teacher training, they said, you know, what skills and qualities do you technically bring? And I guess, you know, after I hung out with a lot of my friends who are older than me, I'm in my 50s, so my friends were in their 60s or 70s. Um, and I guess the reason I was friends with so many older people than younger people is probably because my siblings were about that age. My adoptive siblings were between eight years older than me and 21 years older than me. So I think I always gravitated towards people that were in that age group, oddly. It's funny. And a lot of them, you know, they said, what do you think your particular skill and qualities that you bring to the program are, April? And I said, the types of meditations I do. And my ability to be playful in yoga, even as a 50 year old. <laughs> I'm very playful in yoga, like an otter. <laughs> I'm more like an otter, apparently. Every time I take a Facebook test, it's very strange. You know, I always associated myself with like docs and, you know, like, um, but whenever I put it in, it always brings up an otter. <laughs> I'm like, what are you trying to say to me? And what's even more interesting is when I would put in what kind of otter, it says sea otter. I don't think I've even ever seen a sea otter. I've only ever seen a river otter, I'm telling you. Do sea otters exist, you guys? I mean, have you guys seen them? I keep seeing like, things about, oh yes, April, sea otters exist, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, where? <laughs> I've never seen one. And I think the reason I like the internet so much is people are like, April, why do you go on social media so much? And I was like, are you kidding me? There are so many smart people in the world. I like read all their stuff and they're super, super smart. It's like awesome sauce. Like there's just, so many smart people in the world that know how to do things 
I think it's cool. You know, for me, I like looking at trees. I'm gonna, I'm gonna refer to them as people, okay? Because like this whole like, are you single? Are you dating? Like, what are you doing? All right, I look at people like trees <laughs> and I see a forest. <laughs> um, and technically, I can appreciate trees as they are. I don't necessarily have to become that tree. I don't have to be exactly like that tree. I can be who I am and all of my meanness <laughs> and love that tree over there and know that that tree can exist and I can hear and I can be all that I can be like a flower bringing my, my head up to the sky and letting myself bloom. I'm not mad about the flower blooming next to me. I'm not trying to choke it out. I'm not the one that's invasive. I let you grow near me. I only grow out this far. <laughs> this is my radius. This is how tall I get. This is how wide I get. There are some plants that only get this wide and this tall. I'm not an evasive plant. <laughs> In fact, I'm more like, oh, no, you didn't. Don't, yep, you can, you know what? Lemon verbena, stay over there. <laughs> I can, I can see you. You're pretty. Thank you. You take up a lot of space. <laughs> you need to acquire everything. Why? <laughs> and you need to choke everything out that you're next to. Okay, weird. That's not weird at all. <laughs> and I'm like, as a human being, that's weird. Okay. You know, a lot of people will ask me, like, what's your specific typical type of yoga? And I'm going to honestly say dance. Okay. So I typically loved yoga dance and aerial yoga and aerial meditation. So my two favorites are being up in the silks and uh, dancing in yoga. So something that I really enjoyed um, was dancing, was the sun salutations and the restorative, okay? I even like the yoga where you sing and do yoga. Uh, I have a TBI playlist, and that is kind of my, like, checking in with myself for humility, perseverance, all sorts of other things. Um... And also the acceptance that, why not, you know? There used to be this song, and I know a lot of people hated it. They said, what if God was one of us, like a schlub like one of us, just a stranger on a bus on his way home? And I used to ask my friends about that song and say, if God was sitting next to you, if the second coming of Christ or Buddha was sitting with you on the train, would you know? Everybody believes that this person is coming or these people or this thing. And I invite you to wonder about that. If the second coming was going to come or Buddha or whoever it is, we're going to come down and actually help. In this modern day world, would you publicly humiliate that person and degrade them for what they are? Or would you able to see them? What if they were a bodhisattva? Would you actually be able to think that you could know a bodhisattva or the second coming of Christ? I always used to think about that and think, wow, that's got to be pretty weird, right? That's a really weird thought. And I was like, that's pretty intense. So I offer you to think about laying in Shavasana, being in a relaxed, restorative position, 
focusing on your breath and allowing all this stuff on the internet that's causing you harm to your psychology, walk away from that. There are different channels. There's different people to follow, right? There's millions of people out there. Find the content that is better for you, that puts you in a positive, productive place. What gets you to the better version of you? Hey, be all that you can be. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I always loved that. When I was growing up, I was proud to be an American. I was so excited. I was eight years old. I was running up for my naturalization test. I was pumped. Do I have the picture here? I was super darn happy. And my sister was with me. I was so excited. I was like, you're with me. It was like the, like the biggest, biggest, best day of my life. You're with me. I'm wondering where it is. I have got to have it someplace. I know I've seen it, but I don't know where it is. It must be in my other album. That's interesting. Back in Connecticut. Oh, funny. Okay. So, that's interesting. I don't have it with me, but at some point I'll show the adoption papers. That's creating neat. There's like telegrams and stuff like that in it. And it's pretty cool. So that's really nice. And I interestingly got enough, have an adoption book on how to treat your adopted child from social services when I came here. It was interesting, I read it. It was extremely interesting when I read it. Yeah. So, a lot of people say, you know, are you currently teaching yoga? You know, I suppose the kind that I do is, it, I call it mindful movements and meditation. A lot of people would call it restorative yoga. So, the yoga typically that you guys are experiencing from me is technically called restorative yoga. Regenerative, restorative. There are some that are all different. They do different things for different actions in your body. But yes, I am focused on what's called physical therapeutics of yoga. Okay, so it is kind of like being a physical. In fact, a lot of people that are in yoga physical therapeutics are a physical therapist themselves at hospitals. That is true. That's very true. So my chronic disabilities are technically uh, type 2 diabetes, what's called neck and spine spondylitis, and herniated bulging discs that start up here and go all the way to the base of my spine. This neck is actually technically not fully connected, and so uh, I have permanent damage to one side of my neck. Um, another thing that I have is a damaged vestibular nerve and a damaged vagus nerve. And I have permanent damage to my amygdala, which keeps me in what's called a chronic release of cortisol. They asked what other trainings I had received, and I had received um, trainings in the Forgiveness, Forgiveness Institute, aromatherapy, a wellness products educator, mindfulness and meditation, marketing, corporate communications, graphics, and creative writing. I have been practicing since 2007, 2008, and I do what's called a daily bringing light in. Um, so they said, describe your personal practice 
and how you practice every day. They said, I've only done it a couple of times with you guys in session, but I'm going to do it again. And what I'm commonly known for in my class when I used to teach was called um, bringing light in, okay? I was first referred to my program at Yoga Space. My first lineage teacher was Natasha Raymond. Then I did a mommy and me yoga with Michelle Wenis. I studied with Gloria Owens and Seda and Mimi and Colette White. I forget Mimi's last name. And I'm going to post those pictures. Um, I'm still playing around with the graphics, trying to make everybody look so pretty and trying to make everybody have equal exposure and footage and playing with fonts and stuff like that. It's taken me far too long to make this, this photograph of my lineages. But I, I, I have to stop being a perfectionist. This is why the, the website didn't come up like 10 years ago. <laughs> well, you know, seriously. Um, so at a certain point, I was like, okay, um, you're, you're trying to be perfect on this and it's not ever happening. So uh, maybe you should just start. <laughs> and that's why, you know, it's funny. At first, I was so scared to do these watch live videos. But then when I started doing them, I was like, oh, well, you know, oddly, this is, this is actually easier for me and better for me in a, in a form to oddly teach because I was an auditorial learner, and so I don't have any books. And I teach by um, the same method, oddly. So, I don't know. Thanks, guys. It worked out. It really was helpful. I just want to thank everybody. Um, you know, it's funny, um, everybody's hearing me talk about my PTSD for a long time and the only reason they were hearing it was because what was actually triggering me was trying to help other people. <laughs> no joke because basically I would have to go through everything I'd already been through and I kept having to do it over and over again to help people all these years and I said you guys have to stop you guys are the ones that are actually triggering me <laughs> I was like no kidding me having to explain to everybody all the time what has happened to me since I was like this is actually the trigger you guys aren't letting me out of it and I get that I'm helping people. <laughs> I was like, but there has to be a better way. I cannot be taken out by this just to help other people. So I looked for a different way to share things with you guys so that I could metabolize it. It's not that I don't want to get back to everybody. It's that I was honestly shocked because there was such an overwhelming response. Um, yes, I was in Connecticut and I honestly think my health and wellness practitioners and my family and my friends, they did as best of a job as they could in a scenario where none of us knew what my condition was all growing up. I mean, they think about that. That means that they've been working with me since when, guys? 1970. I've been working with those health practitioners and wellness practitioners so that the rest of you could actually have a benefit and you could actually get help. So some of the supplements and natural remedies that I used, which was very difficult for me to talk about for so long and why I was so made fun of, was that when I was growing up, I was really morally and ethically like straight laced, you know? I really was. I was like, I was going to Bible study group all the way up until the time I was 27 years old, okay? So I used to go to contemplative prayer and adult Bible study till I was 27 years old. I actually kept that a secret, no joke. I kept it a secret from my friends because I was so embarrassed by it. 
It wasn't until I met people at the Universal Peace Center that was like, April, what you were doing wasn't bad. And I was like, really? Because I got made fun of a lot and I got shamed a lot for it. And I feel stupid for being the way I am. And they're like, no, no, don't feel that way. And they're like, it's good to care about morals and ethical ethics and your conduct and how you think and how you speak to people. And I was like, yeah, but I'm almost in a mental institution because I'm worried I'm going to harm people. <laughs> and they're like, oh, no, April. And I was like, I know, I know. I mean, it's crazy. Like, I couldn't even get out there on public television or do all this stuff, you know, to help people because, like, I was just afraid. I was like, well, isn't there somebody better than this? Like, I, I'm sure I study all the time and I see kids in my class and teachers. And I will tell you, everybody has been smarter than me all growing up. I mean, I'm still in university. So they're like, what do you mean you're still in university? I was like, I've never stopped going to school. It's awful. I'm so disabled that I keep having to go over and over again because of my disability, because I will forget, I have to keep going. <laughs> and they're like, oh no. And I'm like, I technically, I don't even know if I ever graduate anything. And they're like, oh no, April. And I was like, well, I mean, I actually did graduate, but I don't know. I was like, I don't know. I was like, I keep studying and everybody else is always better than me. So I don't do anything. I don't know. They'll come and they'll like, well, I'm better at this, April. And I'll be like, yeah, you are. Okay, here. And that's how I ended up with no money. <laughs> Basically, all my friends and family are smarter, better, brighter, everything better. <laughs> everything. everything in the whole, everybody in the whole world was able to say, hey, April, this is how much I'm better at everything than you. And I'd be like, okay, I'm sure you are. <laughs> Let me help you with it then, I guess. And it was funny because I turned around and all my friends were like, but April, we want you to feel like you actually have something that you're good at. I was like, well, I won't. And they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, that's never going to happen. And they're like, what do you mean, April? And I was like, there will always be someone who's better than you. There will always be something that you can learn more of. And unfortunately, what I realized is, oh, my God, I'm never going to have respect. I was like, oh, my goodness. If I am always studying for the rest of my life, that's a humility position. When do you ever actually get any respect? And I was like looking at the timeline. I go, oh, look at that. Never. <laughs> um, oh, wait. Not even at death. <laughs> wow. This world sucks. Talk about a hell realm. Oh, my goodness. Anyways. It's funny because it looks like that. It's pretty crazy. So, what I'm gonna kind of invite you guys to do for homework, just for your own self, okay? And this is kind of what I did, all right? I invite you to get an anatomy book, an anatomy book, okay? And one that's really good is by Leslie Kamenoff. Kind of liked that one. So um, you can study the muscles in it, but by any stretch of the imagination, if you already have an anatomy book, just start studying it. I would say Everybody normally says 10 minutes. And, you know, I don't find that long enough. Can I just tell you? I feel like 10 minutes is not a long time. So when I do a personal practice, I have to say I probably spend 20 minutes in my body, 20 minutes on my breath. But I start, as you see in the morning, with 20 minutes of mindfulness practice 
And that's really about getting my psychology, which has been activated in the middle of the night with PTSD. And I am actually releasing a ton of cortisol. And I'm not even on meds right now. It's kind of terrifying. My heart's going like... I feel like my heart could like beat itself out of my chest and go through that window. And fly all by itself. It's terrifying. <laughs> it feels awful, I gotta say. Um, but as, you know, we were sitting here and I applied my essential oils, it has slowly tapered off. If it doesn't go away after when I teach and stuff like that in the morning and do my meditation and my practice... I will, generally speaking, normally at that time, take my meds. And I find that that's really helpful for me. You know, something that you can look into is Desikachara Iyengara. And... I think what you want to kind of look into is maybe some of the, for your mind, some of the sutras from Patanjali. You know, that might be a little bit helpful. Um, if, if you're interested in, in the yoga text, okay? Um, if you're looking at the other texts, I would say, you know, there's a Bible, and there's Lam Rim. Those are the other two texts I'm familiar with. Um, there's also the Bhagavad Gita. There's a ton of different commentaries on um, Lam Rim. I like Je Tsongkhapa. So that's one that I followed. I really like that one. Liberation in the palm of your hands. It was probably one of my favorites. I invite you to either videotape yourself now and watch your video of your practice, your personal practice, okay? I invite you to go ahead and do that and take a look at what that looks like for you afterwards. And your last homework. Who are the seven direct students of Krishnamacharya? So hopefully you guys remembered that. And, you know, we do this one for Anjali Mudra. So we're going to go over those. And this one for Namaste. May the light be within you. And then a lot of times I'm bowing for the light in others, okay? So you bow to yourself, thanking yourself for the practice. Then you go into Anjali Mudra. And then you can do, I bow to the light within you, okay? That's something that I do. Um, this one's harder. You're going to take your fingers. They're going to go like this. You're actually bracing them this way. You're lining them up. You're bringing them across. And it looks like that. You can either bring it towards you or you can give it out to others. And then you're gonna go into Anjali Mudra. Okay? And that's when you can say Tashi Dele. And this one is Christian. It's um, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And then you say, Peace be with you. Okay. So those are the ways that, you know, I typically leave or say goodbye. Um, and then I know I was going to look up some other ways to say goodbye. And I found one. One was Salute. And one was ciao. <laughs> Those were fun. So, salute and ciao. <laughs> I would like to learn more. So, if you guys are from different countries, in the next thing, if you guys can tell me how you guys say goodbye in your country and give me the way that I can pronunciate it, 
Super fun to learn new languages. Yay! <laughs> I would love that. So if you guys wanna help me out with that, I like to learn new languages. Actually, that's how I met some of my friends. Um, they were from different countries like Peru and things like that. And I got to study with, with them a little bit and learn some other, uh, oh, Sonia, Sonia would be so proud of me. Ready? Como esta? Hola. Hola, Sonia. Como esta? <laughs> oh my gosh, you're going to fall over and faint right now. I just spoke Spanish. <laughs> Wait, I thought I got another one. No, I don't. Darn it. <laughs> We're so close, Sonia. So close. <laughs> oh, wait. Gracias. I remember gracias. And de nada. De nada. Okay, that's, that's it. I know a, like a little bit of French. Somebody figured that out one day. They wrote to me in French, and I actually was like, oh, yeah, I can write you back. They were like, oh, my goodness. But first I said, I don't speak French. <laughs> that's actually what I said, <laughs> because I really don't. I don't. I only know a very tiny bit. So they were like, um, como se va? Like, how are you? And I was like, oh, bien, good, you know? Or I might have said, come see, come sa, which means so so or okay, come see, come sa. So I might have said that, I'm not sure. And something you might find interesting is. Maybe looking up the word ahimsa, A-H-I-M-S-A, -S and learning the terminology of japa, J-A-P as in Peter, A, okay? So some fun things for you. Um, you know, some, some fun things for you guys um, are, you know, looking up what are called joint freeing series. You know, there's a lot of people out there teaching what's called joint freeing series. Those are fun ones. And um, sun salutations. Sun salutations and moon salutations are wonderful asanas to do. So I invite you to try different people's expression of that. You might really enjoy it. Um, some of the mudras that you might want to look into is um, Anjali, Namaste, Hridaya, Bhariva, the five values. And you might want to look up, if you're interested in it, what Om means and Om Shanti. Okay? You know, so those are things that you can look into. And, you know, everybody knows the basics of four square breaths. So there's that. You know, hatha means force. So if you're seeing that in yoga, um, ha means sun and tha means moon. And... It's generally a practice of physical yoga and balance. It's to cleanse, build strength, and endurance. So that's almost the exact opposite of the restorative yoga, okay? So if restorative yoga is not where you're at, you are most likely in ones where you wanna cleanse yourself, build strength, and endurance. You know, most of the people that are coming to me um, have either disabilities or injuries. And they're normally looking for restorative and regenerative yoga, okay? And that might be why there's a possibility that um, quite a few of you might not even recognize uh, this type of yoga. They'd be like, what kind of yoga is that? Well, unless you've been injured or are somehow physically compromised, you most likely have not seen it.
There are a couple of different de actual different de definitions of yoga itself. It's a oral tradition containing teachings for physical, mental, and spiritual well-being, mind, body, and spirit. And for it to be balanced and to have union and for you to have harmony, as we talked about before, within nature. It's what's called a balance continuum. And it's really, I feel like, healthy for the body, but also an ability to be expressive to yourself and compassionate to yourself. I guess um, some pretty well-known yogis are Indra Davi, Padavi, Iyengar, Moan, Desikachara, and Ramaswamy. And I guess people are like, okay, so enlightenment, enlightenment. Well, obviously that's a direct realization of your mind consciousness and realization of um, that you are already everything you needed to be. That you're all that you ever had to be. And that it's a path. It's not a destination. It is one of the most natural states for us to be in. And I think the reason I like it so much is there's, as I explained before, which I'm gonna go a little bit more into, there's what's called parasympathetic. Parasympathetic means that it'll help reduce your heart rate, your blood pressure. Sympathetic means it reduces the production of cortisol. So it reduces fear and anxiety. Um, something I invite you to take a look into, because I'm always talking about it, is fascia. There's a kind of a cool video put out. Uh, you'll have to check it out. And I tend to like... Um, reading it a little bit about uh, Krishna, Krishna Murti, okay? So, um, golly, how do you spell that? Okay, so it's K-R-I-S-H, if you're writing this down <laughs> or trying to type it out. N-A, N as in Nancy, A as in Apple, Murti, M as in Mary, U, R as in Ralph, T as in Terry, I as in Igloo. Um, something else that I kind of invite you to try out is, that's similar for restorative, is Yoga Nidra. Okay, so those are some fun things and really enjoyable. You know, something that we're going to be going over with the aromatherapy is I'd like to go over, um, and there's going to be different classes. So how I was going to actually set up the groups uh, was there'll be like aromatherapy classes and workshops. Um, and then... 
cooking with aromatherapy. And this is actually a, a weird kind of poem I wrote, which I was going to include today. And oddly, this is the title of it. And I wrote this uh, in 2016 before my injury in 2017. So it's finally when I kind of recovered somewhere between 2017 and 2018, honestly. And it's called Loving an Imperfect Person Perfectly. Everyone wants a clear beginning. They want closure. They long for consistency. They want permanence. Already we become imperfect to expect the unexpected. These phrases, should you really build so much faith on a series, on a string of words, like a pearl necklace? Hear these words strung together in a specific order. Is that what humanity is? We build lives, schools, entire systems on a string of pearls. These pearls of wisdom, an ideal, a vision, a common goal on curriculum on the written word. This separation of logic, wisdom, reality, consciousness, is it visited while deliberating? The inconsequential limited views and capacity, is it important to nurture empathy, compassion, and bring forward mindfulness to the leaders of this world? Is it important that our youth have good, ethical, positive role models with positive, supportive, loving, kind communication, that which condones good conduct and ethical behavior and a sound mind. I struggled to learn, to grow, and become different than that which was I was originally brought here in. I study, I aspire to bring the world something more, something better, something worthwhile. It's funny because I search, keep searching, keep searching more, keep trying, persevering over and over and over again, wanting to find something. You love, you're good, you hate, you're bad. I realized I was mostly just studying to help be a better person to my family, to my friends. And in the end, when you do that, will you end up with nothing? Will you have become something that is not something that they originally recognized. And once when loved and told that you would be loved no matter what changes you went through, did that love become conditional? It was myself I worked on so hard. I didn't ever think I could leave my front yard if my backyard wasn't clean enough. How could I judge others? Why would I criticize them? I understand so many afflictions. I understand too many pains. And because I have these medical and physical issues I was born with and then were accidentally incurred, I'm left here on this rock wondering, is it okay with everybody else that I'm okay with that this may be all I ever was 
and all I was ever supposed to be. To a world in need, may you get what you're looking for. Thank you. From Moon of Meditation and more, hope you liked my poem share. <laughs> Thought I'd throw it out there for some creative writers, okay? You can do better than that. <laughs> Go be your authentic you. Go be awesome. Fist bump. Yay. I don't know how you do a fist bump. I'm learning this. I'm learning you don't do this with that. <laughs> People used to pass me that. I'd be like, what are you doing? Okay. Hi. <laughs> and they'd be like, April, what are you doing? And I'd be like, what are you doing? Are you shaking my hand with no fingers? What's happening? <laughs> I've never seen this before. The first time I saw that, I was like, why are you trying to hurt me? Are you trying to punch me? What are you doing? That doesn't seem nice. <laughs> and this kid had to explain it to me. No, no, Mrs. McHale. <laughs> this lovely little boy. No, Mrs. McHale, I'm not trying to harm you. Are you sure? That looks like you're about to punch me. <laughs> He's like, no, Mrs. McGill, you're supposed to meet my fist. I'm like, why would I do that? <laughs> he had to explain the whole concept to it. I said, and you don't find this odd that it's immediately showing somebody that you're closed off to integration <laughs> like, and that you don't want to share or care. I mean, isn't that a little bit weird right there, right? So, you know, I invite you to think about what communication actually is. Most people think it's just the words that are coming out of your mouth, but it's not. It's what you see in their eyes, their body language, who they were, and even more so who they want to be. That's really important, you know? What are somebody's actual real goals? And can they even tell you or are they lying? Right there, a lot of the times when you ask people what people's personal self goals are, they will typically lie if they don't have one. And you'll see what they look like when they lie. Interesting to know, folks. Have a great day.